sources used to enhance tours there. Then I'll show some photos of Deep East Texas markers, most of which are in your booklet, and talk about ways that those could be interpreted for tours using some of the same and similar <coughs> sources. Um, now most of the Texas photos I showed you are ones that were taken by uh, Perky and her students here at the university. Most of the resources I mentioned are either in the back of your booklet or in the handout or both. As far as Texas specific history sources, most of you know those better than I do, so hopefully you will contribute those to uh, Perky and George for future expansion of this booklet. This is Greenwood Cemetery in Columbia, Tennessee, Middle Tennessee. I know for a fact that some people from that county moved to Nacogdoches. Probably from uh, there, people moved to other areas in Deep East Texas as well. So this cemetery is pretty similar to a lot of pioneer cemeteries in this area too. As the pioneers moved west and established towns, they typically included a cemetery in their town layouts. Uh, Greenwood was formed that way in 1809. People buried there include the founders, early businessmen, educators, preachers, lawyers, and some enslaved African Americans and some free blacks. This type of cemetery is very rich in history and could support a variety of tour themes. County histories often list early military veterans and give additional information about their roles during and after their service. Now this marker for Jeremiah Cherry um, doesn't show that he was a constable. That came from a local history book. And one of his uh, veteran, fellow veterans, Edward Chaffin, enlisted in a spy company in the War of 1812. That was also from a local history book, a county. Settlement patterns is another area of interpretation for heritage tourism. Some settlers uh, came to particular parts of the country as a result of land grants for Revolutionary War service. Other people crossed the ocean for better opportunity, particularly the opportunity to buy land. And some of these examples are reflected in your cemeteries here as well. Born in Scotland, um, born in North Carolina, and born in Pennsylvania. Now to enhance this type of tour, it's really nice to have a copy of a land patent uh, showing the grant of land for revolutionary service. And you can circulate that among the tour attendees. You can also give information about the predominant ethnic groups that settled an area. Uh, Texas Hill Country, for example, lots of Germans and East Europeans. In this particular cemetery, President James K. Polk's parents and some of his brothers and sisters and other relatives are buried here. There's one very good source of history for Middle Tennessee. I'm not sure if it exists in Texas. It's called Goodspeed's History. He wrote biographical sketches of some of the leaders of each community. He also gave a list of court officers, uh, sheriffs, postmasters, all kinds of civic offices, and told about the community's settlement and development. Now, to give you an example of the type of information you can find in such resources that's interesting for tour participants, <coughs> listen to this story he tells about James K. Polk's brother, William Hawkins Polk. William was a lawyer, but he was one of several men fined $5 for gambling on elections in 1838. Now apparently there was no social stigma attached to that because later he was twice elected to the General Assembly and he was appointed ambassador to Italy. Also, the University of North Carolina is documenting the American South website has memoirs from people in this time period in this area. And there very likely are narratives on that website for people who, are, who settled this area too. From 
local histories and uh, resources such as Good Speeds. We learn about the first merchants in an area. Now in Columbia, Tennessee, I didn't realize that there was uh, still a significant number of Native Americans in the area when European settlers came in 1800s, 1808. But Goodspeed says that Perry Cohia opened a tavern in 1808 and operated the Indian store where most of the Indians did their trading. They came in droves with their pack ponies loaded with peltries and such articles as they had for traffic. They would remain a number of days in town and would spend what money and trade they might have in whiskey and trinkets. They were particularly fond of chinaware. And similar sources tell us about early craftsmen as well. <coughs> um, Arnold Zellner, whose uh, marker is pictured at the top, was hired by the Columbia Water Company to install their first water system in 1825. And he's also credited with building some of the city's early bridges. Um, on the bottom is a ledger stone of Peter Voorhees. He and his brother were the first saddle makers in town. This marker tells that Alfred Smith died from typhoid fever in 1852. And there's several people buried here who died from a cholera epidemic in the 1830s. Now I found that it's very effective um, to pass around to the tour attendees newspaper articles about such epidemics because that's generally something that's unknown today. But back in settlement period, disease deaths were really epidemic and could almost wipe out a community. Fraternal organization um, markers are very rich in symbolism and we won't go into that right now. But you can get much more information to uh, have uh, an entire tour based on uh, fraternal organization symbolism from books such as Charles Snodgrass's Light from the Sanctuary of the Royal Arch. And that's just one of, of several. This marker is for Hezekiah Ward who held the highest Tennessee position in the Grand Lodge um, of the Masons in 1831 to 33. And the booklet gives an explanation of this uh, keystone shape and the letters that are around the circle. And here's some more uh, Masonic symbols on another grand high priest at the state level. Again, the Snodgrass book gives uh, information about that. And the Association for Gravestone Studies Journal Markers has articles uh, about Masonic symbolism. And those are available online at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and that website is listed in the handout. Many tourists don't realize that, particularly in settlement uh, times, religion and fraternal organizations and education were directly related. Um, Presbyterians, for example, and, and this marker's for Reverend William Mack, who was a Presbyterian. Uh, Presbyterians required that their ministers be educated. So very often, when they first came into an area, they were not only the preacher, they were also the teacher. Dr. and Mrs. Mack were both teachers. She operated a private girls' school. The school where he taught became a Masonic school after the Presbyterians could no longer afford to keep it up. The Masons in two communities banded together to support the school. And African Americans are represented in this cemetery. This particular marker is for um, Dyer Johnson, who purchased his own freedom uh, before 1850, and then later bought his wife's freedom. One of his descendants, um, who lives in the Chicago area, did genealogical research and deposited that at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. From her research, um, and from the research of the uh, local county archivist, we learned that in 1843, uh, Mr. Johnson was one of five people who organized the Mount Lebanon Missionary Baptist Church. It was one of the first churches in the area that was for and controlled by African Americans. Otherwise, they had to attend church with whites and sit up in the balcony or at the very back. This was a very unusual step for the time. 
and as chairman of the First Deacons Board, Dyer Johnson spearheaded the uh, construction of the church next to his own log cabin. I'm not sure that you'll have this situation in Texas, in deep east Texas, but in Middle Tennessee, the Civil War uh, was really uh, dis disastrous for cemeteries because uh, units would go in the cemetery and seek shelter behind markers as they were volleying back and forth with uh, the Union. And you see some of the damage here that we think was caused uh, that far back. It has since been repaired. Now you can get information about battle sites, unit activity, and occasionally individual soldiers' activities in sources like the official records of the War of the Rebellion, soldiers' diaries and memoirs. And here's an example of what a diary can tell you. This one was by uh, a volunteer with the 59th Illinois Volunteer Infantry, Chesley Mossman. November 24, we marched 18 miles to Columbia and then three more, getting into position in a graveyard about a mile east of town. We built breastworks in the graveyard, but the line was such that few graves were disturbed. Plenty of whiskey in town, and men and officers get it and all drunk. We have a line of works from the river above to the river below the town and, and circle it. Possibly, with a view of saving that whiskey from seizure by hood. And the Civil War home front was probably similar <coughs> in this area uh, to what was going on in Middle Tennessee. Women supported the war effort in various ways, uh, from making cloth to smuggling goods to nursing. And according to local historians, Mary Shelton, whose marker is here, was one of the principal managers of the Confederate Hospital and a member of the Hospital Relief Society. And her husband was Columbia's leading tailor. Well, several years before the Civil War, he had taken in an apprentice named Andrew Johnson. This was the same Andrew Johnson who was later the Union president. And he recalled that Mrs. Shelton was like a mother to him. So the Civil War must have been very heartbreaking, more so than usual for the Shelton's because they were close to Andrew Johnson, who was a Unionist, yet they were Confederate supporters. And you can tell um, Civil War stories without having a battlefield in your cemetery. Um, you can use markers of Civil War veterans find letters that they wrote or letters that were written to them. Um, you can find letters that were written even by Union people or diaries by Union soldiers who were involved in the same battles as the person identified on your marker. It still tells the story about the person who's buried in the cemetery. So I see several possibilities for cemetery tours in your area. A large cemetery like Oak Grove uh, could support many different types of tours, could focus simply on military, uh, perhaps a Veterans Day tour, a special tour, a Memorial Day special tour, um, fraternal organizations, uh, religious symbolism, uh, just general community history, art or architecture, or just focus on symbolism. And in smaller cemeteries in rural areas, perhaps two or three could band together and have a themed tour that goes from one cemetery to the other, um, emphasizing, for example, Civil War heritage, or ethnic heritage, or folk art. Um, also for school children, and perhaps even for uh, adult learners or college students, um, class field trips could help spawn local tourism. Um, for example, an adult art class or a child's art class could sketch interesting motifs or make full impressions or very carefully and using proper techniques uh, do rubbings. Uh, and proper techniques are uh, shown on the Association for Gravestone Studies website. Um, you could even sell some of that work at a fundraising event to help support your cemetery. 
And I mentioned earlier, Good Speed's history. Um, this is a link, and I'm not sure I got this one in on your handout, so you might want to jot it down. Um, if you have someone you know came from Tennessee, it would be worth your checking this site out. Because very many uh, people who started businesses in Middle Tennessee and West Tennessee later moved on to the New West, to Texas, to start businesses again. And of course, conducting Google searches for names is something you probably already do, and that can be very productive. Um, postings on um, Ancestry.com <coughs> frequently have bits of personal history that are useful. Other states of origin, such as Virginia and Georgia, um, and this person in Oak Grove was born in Georgia, um, may have resources similar to Goodspeed's, even if he himself did not um, do histories in those states. This particular boulder, um, I'm not sure which cemetery it's in, but it's in one of your deep East Texas ones. Um, I did a Google search for one of the names here, uh, shown at the uh, bottom right, Colonel Samuel Doak McMahon. Doak is an old East Tennessee name. And I hit pay dirt. Uh, Dr. Ar Archie McDonald <laughs> has a website with a short history of the preacher and your area Methodist online. Um, and it talks about the establishment of the first Protestant and first Methodist congregation in Texas. And interestingly enough, uh, McMahon and his wife Mary in Murray County, Tennessee, which is where the cemetery I just showed you earlier is located. So there is a definite connection between the two places. Inside the front gate of Oak Grove Cemetery is this section for um, soldiers killed in, I believe all of these are World War I. This would be especially a um, good place to start for a Veterans Day or Memorial Day or Flag Day tour. Most cemeteries have a few Civil War veterans and you see the Confederate marker on the left and the Union on the right. This Union one is in um, one of your Deep East Texas cemeteries. Um, the first website I go to is the one shown at the top, the Civil War Soldiers and Sailors website. And I know some of you use that. I uh, heard earlier today that you did. The one at the bottom is unique to Texas. Terry's Texas Rangers were a very key part of the Confederate strategy. They have an excellent website, lots of resources there. Cross swords or guns usually indicate the person was killed in action and was very likely an officer. So it might it's usually more likely that they will have an obituary, perhaps as a Confederate veteran, or more information in the official record, or uh, in biographies of commanders uh, such as um, Sherman, or uh, biographies about Nathan Bedford Forrest and others. In that military section I showed you earlier, this is a close-up of one of the markers, and you notice it mentions a specific battle in France. A lot of the World War I markers do give that information. This website shown there is for the Great War Society, and it's from their Doughboy Center page. This is a great website for World War I. It gives uh, regimental narratives telling you their activity from day one to the end. It also has some individual narratives. Um, I just can't say enough good about that particular website. So if you're researching World War One, go to Great War Society. Now this marker <clears throat> actually included in the inscription A.T. Company, 359th Infantry. Well, not being a military person, I wasn't really sure that AT meant tanker, but it did. And the, if you'll notice, these cat's paws look like the treads of a tank, and that's indeed what they symbolize. Um, so just by Googling several combinations of phrases, I found <coughs> probably two dozen units or more that have Sim, uh, symbols similar to this um, 
And some of those websites include combat information about that particular unit. So that would be a really good resource uh, for you. The Knights of Pythias um, was very popular in East Texas and is still um, a viable organization with a website. <clears throat> the members that I contacted were very helpful in providing information. So if you have uh, people in your cemetery with this particular um, fraternal organization, you'll notice there's all, there almost always is a, a helmet and a shield and the triangle will have the uh, letters FCB. Contacting the local chapters, I think, will be very productive for you. They actually um, are working on a project to document the burial places of all of their members. So um, I think it would be worth your while to contact them. The one, uh, the person I talked to in this area is named George Fox. <coughs> Another fraternal group, the International Order of Odd Fellows, uh, has a website with organizational history and symbols. The most useful site about um, Masons that I found is this one, the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. Uh, also, they're very helpful, um, but their website has abundant information. Most local and state lodges have record books back <coughs> to their uh, establishment. And I've found the local uh, lodges to be very cooperative with serious researchers. Um, and then the books I mentioned earlier by Snodgrass and uh, the Association for Gravestone Studies markers are useful for uh, Masonic symbolism too. Um, Woodland of the World, I think I've seen more of these markers in this area than I have any other one area. Uh, they still have this viable website. Uh, there have been a few books written about uh, women markers. So I think if you wanted to do a tour uh, based on fraternal order symbolism, you could go to their website and contact them and get enough information to um, fill out that portion of the tour. The marker at the top is in Oak Grove Cemetery. It's for Dietrich Rolfs, who was um, a very well-known architect in this area. Um, <coughs> the church at the bottom is the African-American church next to Oak Grove Cemetery, which he designed. And I think a marker like this is not very distinctive for its symbolism. It, uh, of course, you could tell the story of him as an architect and show pictures of different buildings that he uh, designed. But I think it also gives you an opportunity to tell the story of Jim Crow in this area. Um, at the time that this church was built, in most parts of the country, a white architect would not have been designing a building for a black congregation. So there's a good story there, and I think that's one that needs to be told. Um, perhaps this area was less segregated at that point than other areas of the country. Maybe this was just an unusual collaboration. But it is unusual, and I think it gives you a good um, story for a tour. A guy who, named Chris Adams, who's written a book about Roths, has a website. Um, the one that you see at the bottom is not his. The one at the bottom of the screen is the Center for East Texas Studies, which also has information about Roths in this church. But Chris Adams' website, I don't have it here, um, gives pictures of lots of other buildings that Rolfs designed if you wanted to include those in your tour as um, pass around documents, pass around photographs. Now this marker is one I mentioned this morning with the upright wheat. Generally, I'm familiar with this as a symbol of Ukrainian heritage because that uh, is the national symbol showing that country's place as the breadbasket of Europe. And in this country, they preserved that symbol on markers to indicate that they were still able to thrive in the new country. This kept bothering me. Um, so I called a man named Joe Skaliski. 
in Crockett, Texas, and found out that this family name is not Ukrainian. It's Czech. And in the course of conversation, he gave me wonderful history, the type that you can find when you start talking to people uh, in the community. Their family came uh, to this country uh, for opportunity, as did most uh, people from Eastern Europe. Um, they had been tailors in, in Czechoslovakia. When they came here, they couldn't find work as tailors. So they started farming. They weren't good farmers. So they kept moving to try to find um, a good trade. In this area, they started working in coal mines. Well, all of you probably were already aware that there were coal mines in this area, but it was news to me. So if you're doing tours for people from outside your community, it's going to be news to them too. So I think it would be interesting for them to know, well, here's a whole ethnic group of people that followed the initial Czech settlers to find work in the coal mines here. Now this particular guy tells another piece of the story about Deep East Texas. He was a speedboat racer, and that's how he died. Well, lakes are very important. Outdoor activities are very important to this area. I didn't realize speedboat racing was such a big thing in Texas. Apparently it is. You would know better than I. Uh, but I think that would be something uh, interesting for people outside, tourists outside your area. Uh, because most of you already know that. Now this one with the train, just and, and the nickname Hoghead, intrigued me. So I just Googled the name Albert McGuire, and up popped the website of a railroader who used to work with him. And what it says is, in the early 1970s, I worked for a while as a fireman on the Browder switcher for the late Albert McGuire. He once mused that if the United States ever got into another war, we should draft only locomotive engineers and switchmen. When I asked why, he laughed and said, because switchmen won't run and engineers won't look back. <laughs> and as locals, you probably know all about the history of oil in this area, but school children and people like me from the outside are really pretty ignorant about oil, other than we know it exists in this area today. But we don't know about who owns derricks, what the derricks do. How did oil <coughs> come to be so important here? So a marker like this gives you an opportunity to tell about that part of your economic development. And I love this one. Perky found this one and was so excited she could barely talk. <laughs> um, this has to have a good story, and I hope somebody here researches and finds it out. The family buried here has the surname Douglas, and from the little Googling I had time to do, I found out that the Collins Douglas Historic House, now known as Cedar Hill in Crockett, was previously owned by the wife's family. A posting on Roots Web says that Mr. Douglas died of an accident in 1883. Well, they didn't say what kind of accident. Now, I don't know if he was a circus performer, and this is supposed to be a circus tent, but I think there's a good story there that would be wonderful for a tour. So here again, here's a, a task for some of you. Now, one type of tour that I think would really be wonderful for this area is folk art. And a lot of this folk art is ethnic, African American and Hispanic. Here's where I think banding together three or four cemeteries or maybe even more for a half a day tour would be very interesting for almost anybody. Now to find out more about these, you could talk with descendants of people who are buried here, you could talk with people in the community to perhaps try to find out more about the people who made these markers. Um, it, the one on the left, for example, is just very interesting, I think. Um, this person probably made other markers that I don't have photographs for. Um, 
most of these are, well, I shouldn't say most, a lot of them are from Jim Crow days. So you could also use this as an opportunity to tell that story. And I love these with marbles. I think they're just so artistic. The one on the left with the lariat is so uniquely Texan. I, I think that one may have a good story if you can find out who's buried there. There were several pictures that Perky students took of um, markers similar to this with the uh, aggregate gravel uh, set in concrete. And there's several with the, this similar um, bird. Uh, so I suspect that somebody was doing sort of a, a cottage industry uh, with those. There, uh, most of the ones I've seen are concrete. I think we did find a couple that were actually carved in stone. Now you could also do um, just strictly a peace tour. Now I won't go over the meaning of these because that's in your booklet. But people who are interested in art would enjoy this. People who are just curious, people who like history. You know, most, most anybody with intellectual curiosity would like to go on a tour just talking about the meaning of different motifs. And this is laid out the same way as your booklet, uh, with animals coming first, pretty much in alphabetical order, the lambs, then body parts. This is one of the older ones I've seen. Uh, the head looks almost like a skull, and that was more of a transition period from um, the skull and crossbones and winged souls of the Northeast to angels and effigies that came later. And there are entire um, articles written about the meaning of different angels. Um, one of the best books, that, or articles rather, is by Elizabeth Rourke, and that's listed in your um, booklet, I believe. If not, it's in the handout. This is the only hourglass I've seen on a modern marker. Um, it's between two um, sets of leaves, so it may be a little bit hard for you to see at first. And there's a, a beautiful lamp. You have some of the um, most beautifully carved drapery I've seen anywhere in cemeteries around here. It's deep relief, it's very, very finely carved. It's, it's just beautiful. You could do a whole tour based on religion, particularly in Catholic cemeteries. Um, the Catholic iconography is very uh, complex. The booklet goes into it a little bit, but if you have a local priest who's willing to help you with the tour, it, that would be fantastic for people to learn about. Now, I think one thing we overlook sometimes is that kids have such a natural curiosity, most of them are not even scared of graveyards. Once they get in there with a little guidance, they have a ball. You can do things like, um, for ones that are, and I would recommend it only for ones that are school age. Um, you can give them tasks, like find everybody with the name of colors. Okay, so they find somebody named green, they find somebody named black, somebody named white. You can also have them make uh, phrases like from, from surnames, like green crane on thorn bush. Um, ask them to list the states that they see named on markers. Um, you can ask them to find and list initials that are not part of the person's name. So they could come up with fraternal organization um, initials, perhaps, like the FCB on the Knights of Pythias. And their curiosity will hopefully lead them to ask, well, what does this mean? Um, ask them to find um, markers with photos. 
uh, find someone between the age of 15 and 20. And what was on that person's marker? Was it a lamb? Was it a bird? You know, get them to thinking about the difference between markers for young people and the markers for old people. They'll probably be very interested in markers for children. Um, ask them to name occupations that they find. Who was a doctor? Who was a preacher? Uh, who was a nurse? You can ask them to name the different animals they find. Uh, name all the different um, types of vegetation. You know, trees. They could just say flowers or they could say lily, rose, ivy, whatever. Um, ask them to find the youngest person and the oldest person in the cemetery. You can also ask about symbols. Ask them to find a marker with a window. See if they recognize this as a window, the Gothic windows in the upper left. See if they recognize the vase or the planter in the marker at the bottom right. Now, I didn't show much of this uh, cemetery on purpose because it's really not representative of the cemeteries that you have generally in this area. Lots of famous people are buried here. It's real easy to do a tour here. But I do want to mention a couple of um, examples of what can be done even with famous people so that you don't repeat what people already know about them. Now, Washington Irving, for example, um, his house is near, near this cemetery, and the house conducts tours. So when I do tours at the cemetery, I tell people about his funeral procession, which I found by Googling. In Google Books Online, there's a book called Irviniana, a memorial of Washington Irving, and it tells all about his burial. After a private service at his home south of Terrytown, Carriages of dignitaries led a procession through streets lined with residents. Stores were draped in black and white muslin. Over 150 carriages and 500 people on foot, including teachers and students, trailed the hearse to Christ Church, where Episcopal ministers conducted the funeral. Mourners filed by the rosewood coffin with its silver handles and hardware. About 2 p.m. on the mild, overcast November day, the crowd walked from the church to the cemetery, where only immediate family and friends proceeded to the grave site. That's something they don't get when they do the house tour. Artists are usually easily recognizable and easy to enhance on tours. All you have to do is find some of their art on a website like this one, and just print it. You're not selling it, so you're still within fair use of copyright law. All you're doing is uh, letting people on the tour pass it around and look at it. And Samuel Gompers, uh, head of the um, what became the AFL-CIO, he was the first president, um, has an interesting immigrant story. But what I found really fascinating is his papers are at the University of Maryland, and a lot of them are digitized and available online. Now, very often, prominent businessmen, politicians, or union officials like Gompers have collections of their papers at various uh, university special collections departments. And now, more and more of those are being digitized and available online. You could simply find an interesting one and print it to circulate to the people on your tour. And what I do on these, instead of expecting people to read the whole letter, I'll highlight a sentence or two that I think um, is particularly interesting. For example, the second paragraph here, the fundamental principles of the American Federation of Labor ignore questions of race, creed, and color. It is true that in certain sections of the country where race feeling has been accentuated, especially referring to the South, Colored men are permitted to have organizations exclusively confined to their race. What he's doing here is addressing a complaint from a member in uh, Illinois about allowing blacks to join their union. This person thought blacks should have their own union. 
And Gompers uh, is basically saying, well, it's better to have everybody in the same union because it helps everybody. Uh, and that was uh, an attitude of Gompers that I had not known before. Sometimes a marker doesn't tell you much. This one with just the name Graham, I wouldn't have known about if the cemetery had not already identified who she was. This is Florence Nightingale Graham, better known as Elizabeth Arden, the cosmetics entrepreneur. And the Arden corporate website has a brief biography about her. But what I think really enhanced the tour were two things. First, uh, well, three things. This one, um, this website from Duke University Special Collections Web uh, Library has all kinds of advertisements available online. So I printed this, and it's one that I pass around to tour attendees, and the color is wonderful. Plus, it sounds like it just came out of uh, today's ad. It talks about invite your friends to join you for a group lesson in loveliness at the Elizabeth Arden Salon. Sounds like a spa ad for today. Another thing that enhances the tour, there's a website called Brainy Quotes. And I found several of her quotes on their website. One is, treat a horse like a woman and a woman like a horse and they'll both win for you. And this letter is from J. Edgar Hoover to the New York FBI agent in charge of investigating the allegations. And I read a whole series of correspondence. In this particular letter, Hoover suggests to the agent in charge that Arden's services as a special service contact be discontinued. It sounded to me like she was actually an informant for the government um, and used her places of business in Europe as a front to obtain information. Um, after she died, Hoover sent a personal handwritten letter of condolence to her niece. So there was definitely a relationship there uh, with the FBI. And I've mentioned some of the tour types that could be developed, and here are a few of them. Um, landscape design is one I, I didn't go over because um, the vast majority of the cemeteries here are, are not formally designed. Uh, but if you have one like Houston's Glenwood, or maybe some of your larger city cemeteries, they may be. As far as different um, resources, who's who, if you think you may have famous uh, people buried there is one. The Center for East Texas Studies, hopefully you're familiar with. All I know is that it exists, but I suspect that they have lots of good information for you. Um, the National Register nominations, a lot of those are online now. And you may be surprised at how many cemeteries are listed on the National Register. So you, if you get ready to nominate some of yours, you may want to look at some that are already on the register. 